it's pretty easy to differentiate between hands and feet. If you struggle with this, maybe you should consider a different major. Having said that, as we break through the surface and analyze the muscles and tendons of the feet, you're going to experience a certain amount of deja vu. Didn't we see these same muscles in the hand? There are a number of similarities between the hands and feet, which probably reflects their similar function in our quadruped ancestors. Keep this in mind as we explore the muscles and neurovascular supply to the foot. Welcome back. At the start of today's lesson, I mentioned that the feet can really be thought of as a modified version of the hand, with the palmar and plantar surfaces sharing many similarities. This is also true for the musculature, with the foot containing basically thenar and hypothenar eminences, lumbricals, and in the case of the foot, plantar and dorsal interossei. As we progress through, I want you to pay attention to the similarities between the dorsal surfaces of the hands and foot, as well as the palmar surface of the hand and the plantar surface of the foot. This is going to help you to reinforce the material studied earlier in the course, as well as develop a better understanding of the anatomy of the feet. The foot serves as the platform for the body when in a standing position. Much like the hand, it's highly specialized in the animal kingdom. It has a large amount of plantar surface area that conforms to most terrain due to subtle intertarsal joint motions, allowing us to stand using two limbs instead of four. The superficial fascia and deep compartments are highly similar to those seen in the hand. The superficial fascia over the dorsum of the foot is similar to that of the dorsum in the hand. It has loose areolar connective tissue that provides the skin with a great deal of pliability. This is the reason why bruising travels so extensively after an ankle sprain. On the plantar surface, the fascia is of variable thickness depending on local pressure differences and ground contact. The fascia around the heel, for example, is thick and contains adipose tissue for shock absorption. Its thickest point is the plantar aponeurosis, formed by dense regular connective tissue that projects from the calcaneal heel to the digital expansions. It provides an extra layer of protection to sensitive deeper structures and supports the longitudinal arch of the foot. Microtrauma to its attachment point on the calcaneus is associated with plantar fasciitis, which results in pain and inflammation, particularly when initiating movement after long periods of rest. Time to discuss the muscles of the foot. We can divide these up into four separate layers from superficial to deep. We'll start with the superficial layer, which has a common origin off the calcaneal tuberosity deep to the plantar aponeurosis. First is the flexor digitorum brevis. This is found in the central compartment. It originates off the medial aspect of the tuberosity and runs superficial to the long flexor tendons of flexor digitorum longus. At this point, it generates four tendons that bifurcate to insert on either side of the base of the middle phalanges, similar to what we saw with flexor digitorum superficialis of the forearm. Consequently, it's responsible for flexion of digits two through five at the proximal interphalangeal joint. Next, we see abductor hallucis. This is found in the medial compartment, originating off the medial part of the tuberosity. It inserts along the medial surface of the base of the proximal phalanx of the first digit where, as the name implies, it abducts and flexes the first digit. A third muscle is abductor digiti minimi. And this is seen in the lateral compartment. Once again, it originates off the calcaneal tuberosity, this time the lateral portion, and inserts along the lateral surface of the base of the proximal phalanx of the fifth digit. Again, this is an abductor and flexor of the fifth digit. This brings us to the second plantar layer of muscles, which lies deep to the first as an entirely encased within the central compartment. The first muscle to discuss is a rather unique one, the quadratus plantae. It originates off the plantar surface of the calcaneus deep to the flexor digitorum brevis, but inserts on the tendon of flexor digitorum longus as it runs obliquely through the central compartment. Quadratus plantae plays a role in flexion of the toes, but also plays a more important role, it seems, in realignment of the poles of the flexor digitorum longus tendon. Flexor digitorum longus comes in at a bit of an angle into the foot, and so the pull of quadratus plantae tends to redirect it more posteriorly. This would correct any sort of inward rotation. Paralysis of quadratus plantae, therefore, is one of the causes of pigeon-toed gait. Next, we have our lumbricals, very similar to what we saw on the hand, originating off the tendons of flexor digitorum longus and inserting on the extensor hood of the dorsum of the digits. 
As with the hand, contraction leads to flexion of the metatarsophalangeal joint and extension of the interphalangeal joints. This brings us to the third plantar layer of muscles. We first look at flexor hallucis brevis. It originates off the cuboid and lateral cuneiform bones and inserts bilaterally on the base of the proximal phalanx. As with flexor pollicis brevis in the hand, it's a flexor of the great toe up to the metatarsophalangeal joint. Next is adductor hallucis. This actually originates as two separate bands. The oblique head comes off the base of the metatarsals two through four and the transverse head off the ligaments surrounding the metatarsophalangeal joints. It then attaches to the lateral side of the base of the proximal phalanx of the digit one. This is the adductor of the great toe, similar to the adductor pollicis in the hand. It also assists in maintaining the transverse arch, which we'll discuss. Third is flexor digiti minimi brevis. This originates off the base of the fifth metatarsal and inserts on the base of the proximal phalanx, as we saw with its counterpart in the hand. This is a flexor of the fifth digit up to the proximal interphalangeal joint. In our fourth plantar layer, we find our dorsal and plantar interossei. Once again, the plantar interossei are unipennate, as we saw in the hand, while the dorsal interossei tend to be bipennate. We have three plantar interossei that insert on the medial shafts of the third through fifth proximal phalanges and contract to serve as adductors on the digits. The four dorsal interossei attach to the surfaces furthest away from the midline of the proximal phalanx of digits two, three, and four. As with the hand, these will contract to cause abduction of the digits. Before we leave the plantar area of the foot, we're going to take a look at the neurovascular bundles, which we traced down to the ankle in a previous lesson. Remember that we had the posterior tibial artery and tibial nerve, which entered the foot posterior to the medial malleolus between the tendons for flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus. Here, the neurovascular bundle divides to give the medial plantar artery and nerves on the medial side and lateral plantar artery and nerves on the lateral side. The medial plantar nerve provides additional muscle branches to the flexor digitorum and to the first lumbricle and gives off common digital branches that split into proper digital branches for cutaneous innervation to the skin along the middle three and a half digits. It tends to give more cutaneous distribution and less muscular distribution when compared to the lateral branch. The lateral plantar nerve passes deep to abductor hallucis running into the lateral compartment of the foot. The deep branch supplies all the muscles not innervated by the medial plantar nerve. The superficial band supplies the skin over the lateral one and a half thirds. So again, greater muscle innervation, less cutaneous distribution. The medial plantar artery is the smaller of the two terminal branches off the posterior tibial artery. It supplies the muscles of the great toe and has a similar cutaneous pattern to the medial plantar nerve. The lateral plantar artery is the larger of the two traveling with the lateral plantar nerve and curving medially to form the largest component of the deep plantar arch. It supplies a similar distribution to the lateral plantar nerve. Another striking difference between the foot and the hand is the presence of intrinsic muscles in the dorsum of the foot not seen in the hand. First, we see extensor digitorum brevis. This originates laterally off the superior surface of the calcaneus, splitting into four tendons that run obliquely to insert on the long extensor tendons of digits two through five. These are responsible for extension of the distal interphalangeal joints of these digits. Finally, we have extensor hallucis brevis, which originates laterally off the superior surface of calcaneus and inserts on the base of the first proximal phalanx, where it assists in extension of the first digit up to the proximal interphalangeal joint. Last topic for us to consider are the arches of the foot. There are a total of three separate arches for us to consider. The medial longitudinal arch is formed by the calcaneus, navicular, medial cuneiform, and the first metatarsal bones. The lateral longitudinal arch is formed by the calcaneus, cuboidal, and fifth metatarsal bones. It's much shallower than the medial arch and may disappear entirely in weight bearing with the cuboid making contact with the floor. This is typically not the case for the medial arch, but may occur with severe flat footedness. Finally, the longitudinal arch is formed by the cuboidal and three wedge-shaped cuneiform bones. 
The arch is served to absorb ground reaction force during foot strike, dissipating the energy into the bowing of the arches and returning this energy during the toe off phase for walking or running to increase grade efficiency. A number of elastic structures that we see, particularly on medial longitudinal arch, absorb this energy, serving a shock absorption function, and later return that energy to foot flexion during the toe-off phase, which will assist in propulsion of the body forward during the toe-off phase. Arches are maintained in two ways. First is the bony architecture. As previously mentioned, a number of these bones have a wedge-shaped appearance that naturally creates these arches. Most prominent is the transverse arch, where we see the wedged shape appearance of the three cuneiform bones. Second is within a number of soft tissue structures. A number of long tendons cross the ankle and give active support to the arches. Tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior help to lift on the central region of the medial arch, and as we talked about the other day, flexor hallucis longus, because of its line of pull, will be able to draw directly upwards on the sesentaculum tali that it passes underneath, giving an inferior lift to this portion of the arch. Along the lateral aspect, the fibularis longus tendon traverses across the medial aspect of the foot. When this muscle contracts, it generates a compressive force that helps to maintain the longitudinal arch. Additionally, a muscle we just talked about today, the flexor digitorum brevis, spans from the posterior to the anterior portion of the medial arch, and a slight degree of contraction will help to support the space. Finally, we have four distinct ligaments which provide passive reinforcement of the lateral arch. First is the plantar fascia we identified earlier in the class, not shown here. This is what lies just above the flexor digitorum brevis. Additionally, the long plantar ligament and the plantar calcaneal cuboidal ligament, also known as the short plantar ligament, both lie deep to the musculature and provide ligamentous support to the superior portion of this arch. Finally, we have a structure known as the plantar calcaneal navicular, or spring ligament. This runs from the sesentaculum tali of the calcaneal bone to the tuberosity of the navicular bone. Just superior to this ligament is the apex of the arch, which is formed by the head of the talus. Essentially, you can think of the spring ligament as something of a hammock lying between two trees and the head of the talus as an individual resting and sitting in that hammock. That's going to do it for today's session and for our journey through the lower limb as well. This is going to bring us to the third and final unit of the course, where we will consider the internal organs. Until next time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank <laughs> you.